We're super excited to host Dan Becker, who is our speaker today. Um, Dan has been fighting auto emissions for decades and has worked for environmental organizations such as the Center for Biological Diversity and is the director of the Safe Climate Transport Campaign. He is going to give an overview of his work. Um, so I'll just pass it off to him now. Great. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this is my favorite subject, so I'm always happy to talk about clean cars. Um, and uh, Kyan has suggested that um, if folks want to ask questions uh, while I'm talking, that's fine. And uh, whoever is moderating, um, you know, just have, have them raise their hands and, and then you can call on them and tell me to shut up for a minute. Um, so um, I work on climate and cars. I've been doing this for many, many years. Um, and uh, the, the biggest single step that any nation has ever taken against global warming was the Obama clean car standards um, that were adopted in 2012. Um, and those uh, basically required that automakers improve the efficiency of their vehicles. Um, and um, those standards would have saved 6 billion tons, 6 gigatons of carbon dioxide um, uh, if President Trump had not rolled them back. Uh, and so what happened was the, um, so I've, I've worked on this issue since 1989, um, when um, uh, Jim, uh, Hansen uh, testified uh, before the United States Senate that global warming was a major problem. Uh, and at that point, uh, I was working at a group called Environmental Action and was just finishing up uh, the fight for the Clean Air Act uh, that was passed in 1990. Um, and so Sierra Club, which was um, uh, interested in getting involved in global warming, decided to hire me to go figure out what we should do. And so the first thing I did was try to figure out where do the emissions come from that we could control. And two thirds of the emissions in the United States come from vehicles and power plants and a third from everything else. Um, and so I figured, all right, it's gotta be one of those that we're gonna focus on. And so I tried to, I did some research and uh, we commissioned some polling to try to figure out what did people understand about uh, global warming pollution, which at the time was not very much. Um, and we, um, uh, and so I um, uh, basically decided that um, I was going to work on, on clean cars. Um, every gallon of gas we burn pumps 25 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere. And so the fewer gallons we burn, the less pollution goes into the atmosphere. Um, and um, I couldn't figure out a way to win on power plants, and we still haven't won on power plants, but we did win on clean cars. Uh, and uh, it took a long time, and there were a lot of battles, both in Washington and elsewhere. Um, and if people are interested, I can talk about some of that. But basically, um, with, with a major pollution problem, the solution needs to be to pollute less. Uh, and uh, I mentioned before that um, uh, uh, efficient vehicles uh, are, are less polluting. That's again, because of the 25 pounds per gallon. If you burn fewer gallons, you have less pollution. Um, and so I've spent most of my career focusing on, on that fight. Um, we lost a lot and then we won. And then when Trump came in, we lost again. Uh, and now we're in a situation where President Biden has promised to um, restore standards that will control global warming pollution, but he hasn't said how, uh, how strong those standards are gonna be. Uh, will they achieve the 6 billion tons that the Obama-Biden standards would have achieved uh, starting 10 years ago, or will they be more aggressive? And they need to be more aggressive. Um, the problem has gotten worse. Uh, the technology has gotten better. The costs of, of using that technology have come down. Um, so um, for, for a lot of reasons, it makes a lot of sense for uh, the president to, to be very bold. And he said he wants to be. The problem is the politics. Um, you know, Congress is evenly split. The American people are divided. Uh, most Republicans in Congress don't even admit that there's a problem. Uh, 
uh, and deny that global warming is real. Most um, Americans believe that there's a problem, including a lot of Republicans, uh, but the, the elected Republicans don't listen to them in large part because they're elected because they receive campaign contributions from polluting companies, many of which are oil companies that want to sell more gas, not less, uh, and others of which are auto companies which want to sell gas guzzling cars because they can make a lot of money on each one. So um, wh where we are now is um, a, at a crossroads, literally. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the president has said he wants to act and my campaign is um, pushing to have the most aggressive standards that he could adopt. Uh, and the auto companies are pushing back very hard. Um, the, the, the solution uh, to um, uh, polluting cars is less polluting cars or non-polluting cars. And um, the technology to achieve uh, improvements in efficiency and burn fewer gallons uh, is sitting on the shelves in auto companies. Uh, and you've seen electric cars, they exist. Uh, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not rocket ships. Uh, all the auto companies have the technology to make them. Um, and the, the technology is getting cheaper and cheaper as batteries, which are the most expensive component of an electric car, are getting cheaper. Um, so within the next three to five years, it will be cheaper to buy and run a an electric vehicle than to buy and run a gasoline powered one. Um, the battery costs are coming down. The gasoline costs are at least constant and sometimes go up uh, as they have in the last few weeks. Um, and of course, an electric car doesn't use gasoline. So you save all that money at the gas pump. Uh, electric cars do cost more at the front end, but you save over time by not having to buy all that gas. So um, the, the, the electric car solution is, is ready. How quickly can we go from a few percent electric car sales to all electric car sales? Um, and part of that, uh, uh, we need to look at the, the science. Uh, the, um, the leading uh, atmospheric scientists have warned us that by 2050, we essentially need to have a zero emission on-road fleet, meaning that the cars and, and SUVs and pickup trucks that drive around on most streets in the United States and much of the rest of the world will need to emit no pollution by 2050. Now, 2050 sounds like it's a long way off, um, but uh, a lot of cars last 20 years on the road. So you subtract 20 years from 2050 and you get to 2030. And that is, I believe, the last year in which we should allow gasoline powered uh, vehicles to be sold. Uh, up until then, we can make improvements, and I can talk about that in a minute, but basically we need to phase out the gasoline-powered vehicle and diesel, um, and we need to do it quickly. Uh, and that's not something that the auto companies want to do, uh, and most Americans, because they're unfamiliar with electric cars, uh, will, will sort of shrug and say, what? You want me to get what kind of car? Um, and so th there are real problems that we've got to solve. Uh, mostly they're perception problems with the American people and their um, money problems with the auto companies. Uh, so wait, should I pause and see if folks have questions so far or should I just keep plowing through? You can just keep going. And if anyone has a question, you can just put it in the chat and we'll catch Okay, great. So um, why do auto companies do what they do? Um, a lot of what they do, they've done for 100 years. Um, they've been making basically the same product for uh, since the early, since the, basically the turn of the 19th century. Um, four pneumatic tired wheels with a metal chassis using essentially gasoline. Uh, it's, it's what they've done forever. And it's what Americans have, have been used to. And all of your parents probably, and grandparents and great grandparents uh, bought those same kinds of cars, different models, different colors, whatever. But it, it was the same technology. It took a law and the law was the Clean Air Act that, that began to force auto companies to change what they do um, and to begin to look at other ways of propelling a vehicle. Actually, some of the earliest cars were electric cars. 
but the, uh, the, the technology wasn't very good at that time and the batteries weren't very uh, good. They didn't hold much charge. So they didn't go very far. Um, all those technologies have improved. But if you think about the auto companies, which are making the same thing they made 100 years ago, and compare them to almost any other industry, every other industry has totally changed what they do. You've seen the pictures um, uh, of, of a, a, an old gramophone, which had a crank and a big bell, and the, you know people would listen at the bell, and you'd see the dogs sleeping underneath it. That was how they played music. Now you've got, um, you know, online you've got uh, uh, MP3 players, you've got iPads, iPods, all kinds of things. Um, those th th that industry has completely changed. The telephone used to be something that was mounted on a wall. It was this this big. Um, and it had a, a speaker and a crank, and you picked up the microphone and you held it to your ear, and you've seen the movies, you've seen it in, in, on, on TV. You, you turned the crank and you said, hey, Mabel, get me Gladys. Um, and an operator connected you. Now you've got, you know, mine is over there. Anyway, you know what a cell phone looks like. Um, the auto industry isn't, hasn't changed. It's still doing what it's always done. And the reason it's done that is because they make a lot of money making gas guzzling polluting vehicles. Uh, the technology to improve it isn't free, but it's cheaper than the gas it saves. And what I'm talking about, even if you don't go to electric cars, are better engines, better transmissions, the gear shifting mechanism, better aerodynamics, so you're not pushing a lot of air out of the way on the highway. Um, even better tires that have lower rolling resistance, meaning they don't create as much friction with the road. Those are technologies that have been sitting on the shelves of automakers for decades. But because they cost a little bit more, uh, the, the auto companies don't use them, even though consumers would benefit because they'd save money at the gas pump that more than makes up for the cost of that better technology. So auto companies are now selling increasing numbers, not just of cars, but uh, decreasing numbers of cars and increasing numbers of trucks. And by trucks, I mean SUVs, pickups, vans. Those are what the auto companies have shifted to. And just in the last 20 or 30 years, while I've been trying to fight for cleaner vehicles, they've been going the wrong way. And they've been going the wrong way because they can charge a lot of money for an SUV. Uh, the, the Americans think that if it's big, you're getting a lot for your money. Uh, even if some of what you're getting for your money is pollution for the kids in the back seat. Um, the auto companies basically have decided they want to continue making what they've always made for as long as they can, make them bigger, make them heavier, make them go faster, make them accelerate um, more quickly, and, that, and then they advertise that. You probably haven't seen many ads for electric cars. Uh, they don't advertise electric cars because they really don't want to sell electric cars. They advertise what they want to sell. So you'll see lots of ads for pickup trucks and SUVs. Uh, and, and sometimes the pickup trucks are in places where there really shouldn't be pickup trucks. Um, you know, if you have a farm where you're, you're carrying heavy equipment, you may need a pickup truck. But I'll bet you know people who have pickup trucks who are just urban cowboys and driving around the city uh, hauling uh, their ego in, in the, in the flatbed behind them. Um, that's what the auto companies are selling. They're, they're selling a lifestyle. And the lifestyle, unfortunately, is a very polluting one. So the law that Obama and Biden uh, uh, negotiated with the auto companies in 2012 essentially said, we're, we're going to start cleaning this up. The auto companies agreed to it. They actually signed letters of commitment uh, promising the government of the United States that they would not seek to overturn these negotiated standards that would save 6 billion tons of carbon. Um, and then they re reneged and repudiated the agreement that they'd made with, with Obama and Biden as soon as Trump came in. In fact, they went to Trump days after the election and said, please roll these standards back. And four days into the Trump administration, there was a meeting in the White House in which the top executives of all the auto companies came in and said, we want you to tear up the agreement that we made with Obama and the federal government. And Trump then did. So now we're in a situation where there basically is no uh, rule that requires that automakers improve emissions. 
and they're not improving emissions. They've never improved emissions uh, without a law that required them to do it. Uh, when the law has existed, they've complied with the law mostly. Uh, but when, as soon as they have an out, then they will take that out. So um, now we're in a situation where we need to pressure the president not to just restore uh, the, the standards that the auto companies agreed to 10 years ago, but to move far beyond that. And again, thinking about where we need to be in 2050 uh, and that we need to act by 2030 uh, to essentially eliminate gasoline powered vehicle sales if we're gonna have vehicles on the road in 2050 that don't emit anymore. So um, the, the pressure that we're trying to put on the president is friendly pressure. You know, he hasn't done anything wrong yet, so we're not gonna criticize, but we are urging strongly that he act responsibly. Uh, and um, if we can do it, um, uh, later on, we'll show a video, a short video that um, uh, my colleagues and I created that um, is designed to sort of call attention to the issue and then ends with an action item that people can take uh, and, and sign a petition and send it to the president, the uh, Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, uh, and Regan, who's the um, EPA administrator, uh, basically calling on them to, to do a couple of things. To um, set a date of 2030 by which we would phase out sales of gasoline powered vehicles. That between now and then, when literally 17 million vehicles are sold every year. So if we don't act to, to reduce the ongoing gasoline powered vehicle uh, emissions of, of the new gasoline powered vehicles that are gonna be sold between now and 2030, we're gonna have much, much more pollution in the atmosphere to deal with it. And those vehicles are gonna last for up to 20 years. So in addition to the phase out in 2030, we're calling on the president to reduce, require that automakers make vehicles that reduce emissions every year. Uh, meaning new vehicles would be 7% cleaner than the previous year's vehicles. Um, and then the next year's would be 7% cleaner than that. Uh, and this isn't radical. Uh, the Obama-Biden standards had a 5% annual improvement requirement and the auto companies agreed to that. They don't like this new plan uh, and they're fighting very hard. Um, so we're doing the, the kinds of things that we are able to do including talking to folks like you and trying to get you to take action to um, force the decision makers to act responsibly. Um, why don't I pause and see if anybody has questions or, and then I can move on from there. Yeah, there are a couple of questions in the chat. The first one is, what do you think of GM's target to stop selling gasoline cars and SUVs by 2035? Is it ambitious enough? And do you think it will set a precedent for other companies? Unfortunately, it will set a precedent because they're not going to do it. Um, it. It isn't what it seems to be. Uh, if, if, you, if, if people read carefully what GM actually said, they did not make a commitment to end gasoline-powered vehicle sales by 2035. They said that they aspire to end gasoline-powered vehicle sales by 2035, uh, meaning that they hope to, um, but they don't want a requirement. They fought against it. In fact, while they, the day they issued that press release announcing their aspiration, they also were in the, new, uh, the Virginia state legislature fighting a, a, a law that Virginia was about to adopt that would have required them to do what they say they aspire to do, meaning make uh, no, no more gasoline powered vehicles after 2035. So yes, other companies are trying to figure out how they can do what GM did, which is lie about it, and pretend to do something that they don't really want to do. I'm trying to figure out how we force them to do what they claim they want to do and make it actually happen. Thank you. Um, the next one is what is the best way we can fight the auto industry's lobbying? Um, well, one is sign the petition that, that uh, we'll share at the end of, at the end of our chat, uh, our conversation. Um, also, um, you, you know lots of people who uh, might want to buy a vehicle. Um, you know, start with your, your family. Um, when they're in the market for a new vehicle, I'm not saying that people you know, need to lobby people who just bought a vehicle to get a different one. But you know, uh, a lot of people change 
the, the average new vehicle stays in the purchaser's hands for only four years, and then they sell it to someone else. Um, so people that you know who are in the market for vehicles, talk to them. Um, if it's your family, say, look, um, you know, 25 pounds per gallon comes out of the, the tailpipe, uh, whether you're driving a Hummer or a hybrid, why don't you buy a hybrid instead of whatever you're going to buy? Why don't you buy a car instead of the light truck, meaning SUV or pickup truck that you're thinking of buying? Um, and so first of all, work, work on the people that you know whom you can influence. Um, don't, don't be mean about it, but tell them what, what you care about and why it makes a difference. Um, and there are lots, there's lots of good information both on, on our website, um, safeclimatecampaign.org, um, and lots of other websites from other organizations uh, that can explain some of the technology and, and what the choices are. Um, also, EPA has a, uh, a fuel economy guide. So epa.gov, uh, federal government has basically um, rated all the vehicles as to how polluting they are. Uh, and you can um, urge people to get on that website, either with you or on their own, um, and compare vehicles. And there, there's a comparison vehicles um, uh, uh, device on the website that allows you to say, all right, how much would this one emit compared to that one that I'm thinking of? Um, so first of all, help people choose better vehicles. Uh, no, actually, first of all, write to President Biden. Second, help them choose better vehicles. Third, talk to people. Um, e explain why you feel that it's important that the auto companies act responsibly instead of irresponsibly the way they've been doing. Um, and then you can write to your members of Congress uh, and urge them to support strong EPA standards. We don't want legislation because with a split Congress, we're probably not going to win something that's very good. But members of Congress can certainly write to uh, the EPA administrator and say, hey, I'm hearing from my constituents that you've got a choice to make and you can make either a sounder pro-environment choice or one that the auto companies are, are urging you to do. I recommend that you be more environmentally sound. <clears throat> so there, there are a lot of things that we can do short of, uh, oh, and social media. You know, when you see an ad for uh, a, a vehicle, you can comment on, on your um, uh, social media uh, accounts about what the choices are uh, and whether the, the pickup truck that they're advertising is really suitable for um, the, the, the people whom they're advertising to try to buy it and whether it's suitable for the climate and what it will do to, to your generation uh, who are gonna have to clean up our generation's mess. So those are four or five things that you can do. Great. Um, that's it for the questions for now, but if anyone has more, just feel free to put them in the chat. Um, do you want to transition to how you got involved and your work? Sure. Um, so I've always wanted to cause trouble um, to um, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable um, back as far as I can remember. Um, and so when I went to college, I took lots of different courses. Um, uh, that would, I thought, equip me to be more effective uh, as an advocate. And um, one of the best things I did, even though I wasn't a major, uh, was take a lot of English classes and um, do a lot of writing, uh, writing classes. Because the one thing that most advocates are least good at is writing clearly. And whether you're writing uh, uh, for a newspaper or for a website or for social media, writing clearly is, is the key to communicating with almost everybody. So um, I, I took a lot of English classes. Uh, and um, then when I um, got, got to each summer, I tried different kinds of experiences to get a sense of where I could make a difference um, and had different internships. And uh, I learned a lot from my internships. Um, so I, I strongly recommend doing that. Um, the first job I got out of college was working for Ralph Nader. Uh, and Ralph Nader um, uh, is a, a genuine American hero. Uh, first of all, he's one of the only people who was active in uh, making change in the 1960s and is still active doing the same thing today. He's about 80, 
84 or 85. Um, he uh, started out as a consumer advocate and um, he created a bunch of organizations from the public interest uh, uh, research groups, PERBs, uh, to the Center for the Study of Responsive Law, to Public Citizen. Uh, so he's created a lot of institutions to advocate for uh, consumers and for responsible uh, uh, policy. Um, he was very involved in creating um, the, the EPA and the consumer, uh, the, what is now called the Consumer Product uh, Com Safety Commission. Um, and he lost a lot of battles. Um, but working for him uh, after college was one of the best things I've ever done. Uh, I learned an enormous amount about how to be effective and um, how, to, how to make trouble in a positive way. Um, and that anybody can make a difference. You just have to apply yourself and be focused on what your goals are and try to bring other people into the fight, just as you're doing uh, with the summit. Um, you know, educating colleagues, uh, reaching out to, to bring other folks in, and then turning your action uh, against the target. So um, I, I learned a lot from, from Ralph Nader, and uh, then he sort of forced me to go to law school, which I hadn't planned to do and didn't want to do, but it was good for me. Um, and I became a better advocate having, uh, having become a lawyer. Um, after uh, law school, I worked for a couple of different environmental groups, um, uh, environmental action. Um, and so I, I think the days are over when someone graduates from college and then goes to a job and has that job for life. Um, uh, I, most environmental uh, colleagues uh, have worked in different groups um, and um, each group has a specialty, and so they try to um, learn, work with that group and learn that specialty. Um, and uh, the, the first group that I worked with, Environmental Action, was the group that founded Earth Day. So they were the ones in 1970, this was before my time, um, I'm old but not that old. Um, uh, they, they did the first teach-ins, and, and uh, Earth Day was originally designed to blow the whistle on the environmental degradation that was destroying the planet. And it was very effective. Um, and people, there were uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets and holding educational festivals in every major city and, and many towns in the US and elsewhere. Um, and it was really a, 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 an issuance of a clarion call to action to protect the environment. Um, a bit like what Greta Thunberg is, is doing today, um, finding ways to, to, to take action. And it's what you're doing today. Uh, so Environmental Action was the first group to do that. Um, and and uh, they basically founded the environmental movement. Um, while I was working there, um, I worked on the Clean Air Act and I worked on toxic waste legislation called the Superfund. Um, Superfund was an interesting fight because we, um, there, there, there were a lot of chemical companies that were just dumping toxic chemicals uh, in the land, in the water, dumping it into the air as well. Um, and the government really didn't know what to do about it. And then once it was dumped, it was very expensive to clean up. So uh, the Superfund uh, bill created a, a liability scheme, uh, which was the thing I mostly worked on, which basically said, if you dump or have any role in the dumping of toxic materials, into the air, land, or water, you are legally liable to clean it up. You may think you'll get away with it, but if anybody ever catches you, you're going to have to pay the billions of dollars that it would take to clean up, sometimes millions, uh, to, to clean up uh, those sites. And it created a $9 billion fund uh, in which chemical companies initially paid into a fund for the federal government to use to clean up uh, waste sites where they couldn't find a company that uh, had done the dumping or the companies had gone bankrupt to avoid liability. So um, the, the, the first chunk of what Superfund did was create basically a, a hammer. If, if you do bad and you're caught, you're gonna pay. Second thing it did was it told people, go out and find these things. So it created the right to know uh, Title III of Superfund which essentially said to people like you and me, if you know about toxic waste dumping, 
you are allowed to go find more information about that at your public library. And then you can report it to the federal government and we'll go after those dumpers and hold them accountable. So it, it was a very effective law. It's still on the books. Uh, the, 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 it, it has changed um, the, the behavior of many chemical companies and many other companies. There isn't the kind of midnight dumping that they had been doing. Um, and many of the, the toxic waste sites have been cleaned up, although there are many that remain because there were so many to begin with. Um, at the same time, uh, as I was working on that, the Clean Air Act was about to get rewritten. And um, so Clean Air Act was originally passed in the, uh, basically in 1970 in something like the form that we know it. And it essentially said, um, uh, it is illegal to pollute the air. But um, how much pollution is legal? Uh, how do you um, enforce uh, a, a law that says you can't do that? There are a lot of challenges. So in 1990, the, uh, the, the rewrite of the original 1970 law uh, was up and we basically tried to expand it to cover three different kinds of pollution. Um, we tried for a fourth, which was um, uh, greenhouse gases, but we were defeated on that. But we did get acid rain uh, controls, which have been somewhat effective in cutting down acid rain emissions. Um, toxic waste, uh, to toxic air pollutant controls, which have been very effective uh, in, in cutting down toxic emissions in the atmosphere. Benzene, toluene, xylene, some of these very toxic uh, chemicals that the chemical companies used to just vent into the air. And they're still venting a lot of methane, but because that's not considered a toxic air pollutant, it, it wasn't controlled. Um, and then the third was um, smog. And uh, smog, we, we've made real progress on smog. Uh, much of smog, uh, which is basically um, the, the products of combustion of gasoline and other fossil fuels in cars, most of that came into the atmosphere and is cooked in the presence of sunlight. So it, the car doesn't emit smog, it emits volatile organic chemicals or nitrogen oxides and the solar uh, radiation cooks it into smog and then you can see it. Um, you know, if you go on a, uh, a high building or, or a hill, you can see it on the, uh, the, the horizon and it's that purple layer at the bottom of the atmosphere. Uh, that didn't used to be there. That's a, a result of, of human emissions. Um, so that has cleaned up a lot in part because what we required was um, a catalytic converter, which is just a, um, uh, a metal canister in the end of a tailpipe um, at the end of the combustion uh, uh, system of a car. And before the exhaust is let out into the air, it goes through these, um, it, it's actually a, uh, uh, a ceramic um, substrate or a ceramic uh, cylinder that has lots of, um, uh, it's very permeable. It's got lots of holes in it. And those holes are coated with um, rare metals like platinum, palladium, rhodium. And the, each of those um, three metals takes care of some pollutants. And so by the time the uh, uh, exhaust comes out of the pipe, virtually all smog forming pollution is, um, is catalyzed, is, is um, eliminated. What comes out, unfortunately, is still carbon dioxide, because remember, 25 pounds per gallon, uh, and there is no way to catalyze carbon out of the atmosphere, out of the, the exhaust. So um, w w the, the clean air fight was a, a very important one in, in, in my life, and I'm still using the Clean Air Act today. So the, the the effort that we made in 2012, and again now with, with Mr. Biden, to clean up auto pollution is based on the Clean Air Act. And um, uh, using a, a section of the Clean Air Act that addresses um, car pollution and requiring that EPA go after the carbon pollution that was not part of the original law, but we actually won a Supreme Court case called Massachusetts versus EPA in 2007, um, that in which the Supreme Court said, carbon dioxide, that's the kind of pollutant that if, if EPA finds that it causes harm, you must control, the EPA must control. And uh, because EPA can control it, 
California and other states can also control it. Um, and there's a complicated way that that happens. But um, uh, basically the Clean Air Act has been our, our best tool to clean up carbon pollution. Um, Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your relationship with the auto industry and the Safe Climate Campaign? Sure. So um, my relationship with the auto industry is um, not a good one. Um, I've run a bunch of campaigns uh, targeting auto companies because they don't act responsibly. Um, and sometimes it's great to have a law in the books. Sometimes in order to get the law on the books, you need to fight the, the bad guy directly. Uh, and so um, what I've tried to do first at Sierra Club when I was there and, and then at the Safe Climate Campaign and now at the Center for Biological Diversity where I work today, um, basically take the fight to the polluter, um, challenge the auto companies uh, directly. And some of it is um, using the press, which is a great megaphone to communicate. Um, the auto industry spends $14 billion every year advertising and claiming all these wonderful things about their themselves and their products. I don't have $14 billion. The entire environmental movement doesn't have a tiny fraction of that. So what we try to do is, is use the, the, the free media, the, the, the press, reporters, editors, um, and basically um, have use them as a megaphone to tell the story about what pollution does and how you need to get involved to hold the polluters accountable. And sometimes the polluters are companies like Ford and GM. Sometimes they're um, uh, politicians like Trump, hopefully not like Biden, um, that he won't, he won't turn into that. Um, but we try to use um, accountability tools. Sometimes a, a lot of the media um, uh, I write op-ed pieces for um, publications and for uh, websites, um, and they're all on our website, so you can go read them all if you're, if you're really bored. Um, but uh, using social media is also a way of, of sort of tweaking the auto companies about what they do and, and how they need to do better. And then obviously lobbying, um, you know, when, when we can take off masks and meet people in, in person again, uh, it'll be easier, but right now, um, you know, you, 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 you politicians um, know that they are required to listen to constituents. And so um, since they're the ones who have to pass these laws, like the Clean Air Act, um, a lot of my time has been spent trying to convince certain politicians just enough to, to win a vote um, that uh, they need to vote for responsible laws that will control pollution. Um, we always, don't always win. We've lost a lot before we won. Um, and sometimes you have to choose the venue uh, of where you can win uh, very carefully. So uh, during President Clinton's um, term in office, he basically refused to do anything other than yammer about how important global warming was, uh, even though Al Gore was his vice president. Um, and he promised to do good things, but he never actually did them. And um, I spent much of the time during his term trying to convince Congress to, to pass laws and then to have him sign them. They wouldn't do it because they knew he would veto it or would uh, find a way to weaken the law before it got to his desk. So after several years of fighting in Washington to try to get the federal government to act, um, I moved the fight to California where there aren't uh, very many auto plants at all. <clears throat> and where the, um, uh, the electorate is much more environmentally sensitive than the, the voters are nationwide. Um, and the legislature um, is often willing to do environmentally sound things. So after a year and a half fight, um, we actually got a, a bill passed in the um, California uh, state legislature, the first bill ever in any jurisdiction in the United States to control auto pollution that causes global warming. Uh, and so um, when that passed, the auto companies immediately decided to attack it. Uh, they took us to the Supreme Court in what became the Mass, Mass versus EPA case um, and uh, tried to overturn it. Um, 
but eventually it, the writing was on the wall and they, even the auto companies recognized that we were gonna win. And what they really didn't want was to have all the different states pass their own different law and then have to um, sell different kinds of cars in different states. And so um, eventually some of the auto companies uh, went to Congress and said, all right, we understand we've got to do better, um, but let's just do one thing. Let's all hold hands and jump together on, on new rules and not have California have one set of rules and Washington have a different set of rules. Uh, I, of course, want every state to be able to do as many different things as possible and drive the auto companies nuts. But what ended up happening was that California did adopt the, these standards and then the federal government essentially adopted the same ones. So we ended up with California being the lever that forced action in the federal government. So we, we, won, we won in Washington by winning in Sacramento, uh, California's capital. Uh, so venue sometimes makes a real difference. And um, going head on at, at your target doesn't necessarily produce a victory. Sometimes going sideways and zigging and zagging can get you what you really need. Um, and I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I, I'm an advocate. Um, I, I uh, have never worked in a lab except as a high school student. Um, and um, uh, I, I don't wanna litigate because that's not my strength, but um, I, I try to argue effectively and write effectively, remember English, um, and um, you know, try to use the skills of, of a lawyer to, to get what we need to get uh, in, in terms of cutting pollution. Um, you know, when, when President Clinton was avoiding doing what he needed to do, um, he decided to appoint a commission uh, that um, would debate uh, these issues and then would give him advice. Um, and so I got appointed to this stupid commission uh, with a bunch of auto executives. And we met every month for two days uh, in Washington and once in, in Los Angeles. And we would debate what, what should go into the report to the president. The auto companies basically tried to shut the whole thing down. And they refused to um, allow a report that included uh, a recommendation for cleaner cars. They wanted uh, better gasoline because they don't make the gasoline. So you know, let them fix the problem. Um, they, they wanted people to drive less because they don't care if you drive less. They just want to sell you a car. Um, and, those are fine, we're, we're for those, but um, they, they refuse to allow uh, any mention of, of cleaner cars. And so um, I organized the, uh, the commission, the major majority of the commission uh, to recommend uh, all three. So cleaner cars, cleaner fuel, and um, urging people to drive less. Um, and the auto companies boycotted it and uh, blew up the commission. Um, so th th that was not a good, a good relationship with the auto companies. Um, and then um, I talked about accountability. Um, we don't have the resources in the environmental community to fight everybody at once. And so um, Ford Motor Company was, has been my major target over the years. And partly that's because the company uh, is, um, um, the chairman of the company, formerly the president, is a guy named Bill Clay Ford. And Bill Ford is the great, great grandson or great grandson, I can't remember which, of Henry Ford, who invented the uh, Ford Motor Company and largely invented the automobile. Um, and you can still see Model T Fords occasionally in museums or, or uh, in, in some rural area. Uh, somebody's kept one for, for amusement. Um, Bill Ford kept saying, I'm an environmentalist, I, I care about the planet. Okay, so if you really do, then um, I'm gonna try to hold you accountable. And I'm gonna um, stand up and demand that you make the kind of vehicles that you claim will protect, that, that you understand will protect what you claim to care about. Um, and Bill Ford and I have met a couple of times. Um, we had cordial meetings, but um, we've disagreed a lot. And um, at, at one point, um, Ford Motor Company decided to produce uh, the, the Ford Excursion, which was a giant SUV, the biggest that had ever been made. I think the biggest that's been made to date. Um, it got 11 miles to the gallon. It barely fit in the garage. And a reporter called me up and told me that Ford was about to do this. 
And at the time, they had not yet come up with a name for it. And at this time, which was the mid 1990s, the internet was, was relatively new. Uh, and so I decided um, to hold a, a, an online contest to name that gas guzzler. We had big pictures of, of the Ford uh, excursion to be, um, and we talked about what, what its, its um, uh, specs were, uh, how much gas it, it consumed, how big it was. Um, and we ended up getting lots and lots of entries. And the winning entry was the Ford Valdez, named after the Exxon Valdez that ran aground in um, Alaska and, and nearly destroyed the, uh, the, the bay in Alaska with oil. Uh, and um, Bill Ford didn't like that, but he kept slipping in speeches and referring to his excursion as the Valdez, which was a lot of fun for us. Um, so sometimes you have to use humor and you have to use unusual methods to get your point across. Um, and um, so Mr. Ford appointed somebody from his, um, his personal office to basically keep track of me. Um, and uh, this was a smart person who would call up every once in a while and say, look, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. And I would appreciate it if you would tell us what you're going to do. Um, and we would have cordial conversations about what Ford was planning. And sometimes it was good and usually it was not. And I would share, you know, reasonable information about what environmentalists were going to do. Um, and um, at, at one point, they um, told me that they were about to announce that they were going to make their SUVs 25% more efficient over five years. And if, if they did that, would I, um, on behalf of Sierra Club, applaud that action? And I said, yes. So um, they made the announcement. I gave the applause. And then about two years later, uh, the, uh, my minder at Ford called up and said, no, Dan, you're going to be very angry, but uh, we're going to have to cancel uh, that commitment and we're not going to do it. And I was just rip shit and we, um, uh, you know, we attacked Ford viciously and ran ads, a uh, colleague organization ran ads of um, a, a room, a, a giant room full of what looked like flag draped coffins, except if you look closely, these lines of coffins had um, rear view wind, uh, uh, side view uh, mirrors sticking out. So they were coffins um, that were basically SUVs. And the SUVs, of course, use a lot of gasoline. And at the time, um, of, this was the time of the, the Gulf War. And um, a lot of soldiers were coming home in coffins, uh, fighting for the oil that would end up filling SUVs. Um, sometimes we need more um, support and, and more allies than we've got. And so I worked with um, a, a number of union leaders to create the Blue-Green Alliance. Uh, blue meaning um, blue collar, green meaning uh, enviro. And it took us the um, better part of 11 years to finally create an organization that both sides could support. And there were a lot of unions that wouldn't support it. And there were some environmental groups that didn't want to support it. But basically, um, the Sierra Club and the Steelworkers Union joined together, and we launched the Blue-Green Alliance. And um, we environmentalists supported the right to organize and other priorities for the, the, the union. And the union supported action on global warming and cleaner cars. And uh, the organization Blue-Green Alliance still exists. Um, and it, it, it was a way of, of basically linking arms with folks who um, uh, who didn't agree before, and it took a lot of uh, negotiation to get us to to join together. But eventually, we were able to do it, and it it made it made it a big difference. Um, All right, Dad. Um, um, thank you so much for giving us all the information. Um, we're gonna we're gonna shift gears into a, a discussion. So we're gonna open some breakout rooms. We're gonna put the questions in the chat, and hopefully, we'll get some pretty engaging discussion to go on. Great. Well, thank you for listening. And obviously, if you have question, more questions, feel free to get in touch with me. And should I hang on for whatever questions come up? Or yeah, yeah, we'll we'll close back together after about okay. ten minutes, and then people can um, give their takeaways and ask you more questions. Okay, great. Okay, Amelia is going to open the rooms.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Before we get into the video and wrap up with like sending a petition link, um, we are wondering if anyone had any interesting takeaways or interesting thoughts during their um, breakout room discussions. Sure, yeah. All right, let me pull it up. Thank you, Maura, for sharing that. Um, we need everyone to take a second to sign this petition um, that I just linked in the chat. Um, yeah, Dan, if you want to add anything, feel free. I'd be interested in, in people's reactions to the video and, and to other other things. And, um, you know, if you have uh, any reactions to what I said or didn't say. Um, I don't know. I thought what you spoke about with advertising, we spoke about that in my breakout room and how um, popularity is like connected to advertising, like both political popularity and like societal popularity in terms of like um, consumerism and that kind of thing. Um, and we were talking about ways in which um, cars are advertised now that are connected to sort of like um, toxic masculinity or hyper masculinity and like how um, potentially changing or shifting how we think about or advertise electric cars would have an impact on the populations who would feel inclined to purchase them. So I think your idea about that created a really cool conversation in our breakout room and I thought that was really interesting. So thank you. Great. Um, something that I was really surprised by was just the effect to which not just like avoiding changing to electric but also avoiding general progress in terms of like making automobiles more efficient. In my breakout room, we were also thinking about greenwashing and how a lot of companies have their car ads in nature, driving through the trees or along the coastline, and how consumers might feel better about buying the car if they think that it's more eco-friendly or it's advertised that way. Well, and they also name, name their vehicles, um, <clears throat> green, green sounding things. Uh, if, if you knew that uh, the Toyota Tundra, which is a giant uh, truck, uh, <clears throat> was actually destroying the Tundra and melting it, would you buy it? They won't, they, they won't call it the, the Toyota polluter they call it the Toyota Tundra and the, the, the GMC Yukon. Um, they, 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 like <clears throat> they like outdoor names and beautiful places and especially cold places. There's no Caribbean car. Um, another thing that we talked about in my breakout room was the connections between accessible public transportation and how that relates to um, banning gas vehicles, because if more public transportation is available for people to use and they're more inclined to do so, um, people will gradually start to shift away from gas powered vehicles, which both of those are good. Well, I, I, I've never driven to work. <clears throat> I always take public transport. Um, 
but you, you, you guys can be a focus group for me. Um, given COVID, um, are, do you think people are going to be nervous about taking public transportation? Um, I think that certain populations might be, but like a lot of people, at least who I know, who have to take public transportation to work, it's like not so much a choice. I mean, I feel like the populations who would probably be most inclined to take public transportation, public transportation in the first place, um, might not have the, you know, the ability to be concerned about COVID if they just like need to get to work. So. Two points that came up in our breakout group uh, were um, helping people uh, with subsidies for buying cleaner vehicles and um, getting more information about clean vehicles. And I mentioned when I was talking about how EPA has this website called um, fueleconomy.gov uh, in, in, in which you can learn about cleaner vehicles and compare one with another if you're, if you're interested or, just, or shopping. Um, but there are also subsidies, there are tax credits for um, cleaner vehicles, for hybrids, for plug-in hybrids, and for EVs. Um, they're limited in, in the amount, uh, but it's 7,500 bucks for a um, relatively clean vehicle. Um, and um, that, that can make a difference between buying uh, a, a less clean and a cleaner vehicle for some people. Um, but there are also caps on how many vehicles qualify and most of the companies um, or some of the companies have already um, gone through the cap like Tesla, um, which uh, <clears throat> has much more expensive vehicles. But um, once you've sold 200 vehicles, uh, 200,000 vehicles, the, uh, the tax credit starts to go away. Okay. But there have been those things and they will, they will be renewed. Um, but the reality is that neither the information nor, nor the tax credit has convinced the, the vast majority of Americans to buy cleaner vehicles. Uh, that's why we need laws and, um, uh, and tough, tough regulation from, from EPA and, and states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we're gonna wrap up now just because we're out of time, but thank you so much, Dan, for coming and sharing all of your interesting projects and work and just so much information with us. Um, really interesting to hear from you and we appreciate you coming. Well, thanks. Thanks for listening. I appreciate uh, the opportunity and do great things. <laughs> thank you.